All right, guys, so this is the social pecking order of Final Fantasy XIV video that was recommended to me on my stream by chat. So let's just check it out. It's a holiday miracle, travelers. Welcome to another unholy video. Today, is that his character? I will explain each social group of player and where everyone fits into the pecking order, from the very worst to the absolute Low class, tippy top of the to high class. class. So without wasting any time, interesting choice of start words. with the bottom, the absolute worst people that you will encounter. The kinds of people who you are unsure Not the newbies, right? if they're a human being or a pile of garbage that has gained sentience oh, and what joined the fuck? your duty roulette. These are I the love kind this guy, of players ready. who simultaneously have no idea what any mechanic in the game does and have no idea how to play their class properly on top of it. The DPS players who don't AoE, the healers who don't even DPS but still manage to drop the tank, and they deflect any sort of mild criticism. Deflecting the criticism like is the with, thing. You don't pay my sub. Right. Thankfully, the game does put a little symbol next to these players so that you know what you're getting into ahead of time. The Sprouts? I'm talking about mentors. I am not exactly sure what attracts people to the status, but the absolute scourge of the world are just always mentors. Wait, so I've seen that icon on a couple of players. I assume that you get it somehow through an in-game mechanic. Like, I see the Sprout icon, and I've seen a couple of other icons that look like there's some kind of a social rank within the game. So I assume that it was just some algorithmic thing that you earned with more game time. So... I assume that that status was somehow exalted, that you'd have to complete a certain number of duties or cross a certain threshold of gameplay to get that. So the mentors are actually the worst ones in the game. Maybe it's the fake mentors. I don't know. I'm pretty sure if Hitler was alive, he would have been a mentor in this. Like the mentors who pretend to be mentors, but they're doing it for some kind of like holier than thou satisfaction. This game. After wondering why that shit stained crown even exists, I have finally pieced it together for you. They serve as a prime example of how not to play the game. Thankfully, this club is exclusive, so there's not too many mentors to encounter. But they do make one. up the absolute bottom of the social hierarchy. All right, the absolute Moving bottom. Moving up one step from the very bottom, we have our peers, specifically in Limsolo Minsa. Now, this is a class huh. of players that are only just above mentors. Every godforsaken time you have to do something in Limsa, it's a group that single-handedly makes you fill with dread. Now, there's always an orgy going on in the Aetherite Plaza. I've seen that many times. Some other... I've seen that many times where just traveling through there, it's like a bunch of people always piled into like a row, a couple of rows stacked towards the edge of the part that connects to the marketplace. And at times, at night, I would see groups of people just, like, raving glow sticks. For some reason, it happens more in Limsa Luminsa. So I figured that's, like, what, like, the, the RP hub where everyone goes to AFK. Degeneracy that maybe that's just an MMO thing about. that uh, I'm not now, familiar with. Now, I do with. not care what two consenting adults do in their own time, but Ram Ranch is What's looking up? like an abstinence-only training camp by comparison. Like, my God, why is it always in public? The only thing good about Scholar was letting you get out of this shithole after level 50. Wait, but are... Is he basically saying that all the RPers are ERPers? Because I can... I haven't actually encountered very many situations with RPers, but... I imagine there must be like some casual RPers, ones who use the game itself as a platform for social media type of activities. Not all of them are degenerates, I don't think. If you ever think that you've done something cringy in your life like I have, always remember that at least you're not part of this crowd. Maybe I'm uncultured and my antisocial tendencies are too high so I don't <laughs> understand the joy of emoting for 12 hours in the same spot. But my god, it's just so annoying. Just take a big swig of your favorite the liquor before visiting the city in the middle of the night and pray that you're too wasted. The excessive to emoting, the I guess, is the indication right, of an RP. This next might seem a little bit oddly specific, but I'm going to be talking about people who make class guides on YouTube. These people are always so irritating, asking you to I've subscribe only seen a to their channel. Yeah, that's true. Some bullshit. 
I bet they're not even mediocre at all the classes that they play. Sometimes, they even have the audacity to post their shitty content onto your favorite subreddit. The absolute nerve of these people. Even I don't better, use Reddit, I, I use Discord to some degree. Final Fantasy too. Thankfully, it is always hard to tell who these people are while playing Final Fantasy, but they're always lurking somewhere in a corner. Well, if they make guides, that's just helpful all around. Now, whether or not they are able to be as good as they claim to be in those guides, or, yeah, I mean, experience does not necessarily equal expertise, and you could be good at something in theory, but not be very good at something in practice, but that's fine. I mean, it's informative, and as long as they aren't hurting anyone, I don't see how it can be all that damaging, unless they are flaunting it in the chat box or during like a 24-man raid where they're the ones like saying, hey, don't forget to uh, turn your camera that way uh, to make sure that you can see the meteors and the clouds as they're coming. I've done that myself a couple of times, but it was genuine. It was genuine. I have experienced that firsthand and gotten killed by it so many times that, yeah, I just felt uh, a little bit of wisdom to pass around, but I'm not doing it in like a holier-than-thou way, like you got to do this, otherwise, oh my God, why are you here? No. Nah. I don't assume Either that's way, what they meant. They get the title of not being a mentor in game, but they're only a step above by being a mentor on YouTube. Oh. <laughs> Omni crafters. Anyone Omni -crafters. telling you that crafting is not a giant pyramid scheme in this game? Is I haven't gotten into this money. enough to know. Leveling up your crafters is a big scam of being able to put as much money into it to make your leveling experience faster, and then trying to make all that money back by selling crafting materials to other crafters. Now, if and he's saying like signs up ten of their friends, this is some kind of a, the a Ponzi of scheme. In the universe with the number of people that we have crafting that players are you're at the top, perpetuating onto other players, all your shit like real money or your static. I like hard earned gill, I can that understand that. However, like uh, if he's saying like these are like grifters, people that craft stuff and then sell it back at an inflated price, like middlemen or something, that either scam you out of real money or real money that was used to buy real, you know, important items, or hard earned gill that was gained from or hard earned currency that was gained from raids or stuff. Then yeah, I can sort of see that. But I haven't experienced much of the crafting side of this game yet to know for sure. For this social class that I'm talking about is for the true crafters. The people who don't do anything else other than craft. I do admire the... Do nothing else but craft. So basically they are RP crafters. Is what he's saying. Their dedication. But they're also the group that will complain if they have to go into a single instance for a patch that interrupts their important crafting time. The only rotation mastery they need is of the craft. So it does I see. Okay, I see where this guy's coming from. While, okay. At least this group is restoring. I see how he's. Everyone else I see now how he's stratifying people. Flowers, the returning players. You might think it's weird that I haven't mentioned sprouts. All oh, right, but let me flowers are like sprouts flowers that are have just grown. Sprouts. Unlike new players who worst have sprouts. no idea what's going on and are just trying to learn, these people have no idea what's going on, but have preconceptions of what they believe is truly right. So it's a complete coin flip because flowers come in all shapes and sizes. You can get a hardcore player who stopped playing to raise his kid and finish med school only to finally come back and lead your group down the path of righteousness. Or there could be a former mentor who lost the status after the player commendation requirement was increased. Well, I think this has more to do with attitude. Like if you're a flower, as he says, someone that's returning to the game or a mentor, but you have an attitude of preconceived notions of how the game is supposed to work and maybe the game doesn't work like that anymore, I can see how that can be annoying. But just by virtue of them, here's the thing, just by virtue of them being a flower, like they played the game before and they played the game for a while, but they don't still really know how the game mechanics work. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but I'll get into that at the end of the video because I'm getting a sense, I have a sense now, a clear sense of how he's stratifying all these people and it's getting to uh, a subject that I think begs some discussion as far as, maybe not necessarily as far as MMOs, but certainly as far as Final Fantasy. You will find out very quickly if that flower is a beautiful rose or a rotten dead horse arm lily. Oh. Either way, flowers do start to make up the bottom of the middle what the hell was part that? of the social hierarchy. Now, just above that, we have plot watchers. And these players are plot the ones watchers? that don't play the game for anything other than the plot. Only resubbing just for the patch, but not for the new instances, or even the optional instances, just to get that character development. You might think that it is weird that flowers and plot watchers are not the same group. 
the difference between the two is that plot watchers have the biggest ego of any social group within Final Fantasy IV. Again, I think it has to do with attitude, but playing the game just for the story and not for any of the gameplay content, I don't think that's inherently a wrong thing. Again, they're just enjoying... Basically, he's saying that there's people that are enjoying the game on their own terms, and it's terms that are, I think what he's suggesting, are incongruent to what the game is supposed to be or how it's supposed to be played, which I don't necessarily agree with. But then, at the same time, Devil's Advocate, video games are games first and story second, and getting those two things to fuse together is part of the entire experience, so I'd say I partially agree. I mean, the story is being told through the gameplay, so you should be experiencing the gameplay as well to get the whole experience. 14. Always reminding us that our Lord and Savior Yoshi P said that they do not have to remain subbed at all times and it is okay to take breaks. But they are while paying. I do think that so is a true statement and very I think noble, that's they also not necessarily a valid criticism. Say, don't learn how to play your class properly and don't do damage while being a healer. No one cares if you want to run dungeons only once and have never seen an instance without the message a player is new to this duty. That is not an excuse for not having any idea what your class does. While you might think it's weird that this class is so far up in the pecking order, despite being one of the more annoying parts of the community, this group of sycophants have the dev team wrapped around their finger. The sheer amount of pressure they exude to make the normal content as brain dead as humanly possible and further the gap between normal and hard content has earned them this higher rank. Be I see. So I think what he's getting at is that these are like the the hardcore plot watchers who are focused only on story to the detriment of the gameplay. They're the ones who are like super criticizing this on like a very literal level, literary level. And, you know, the writing team is kowtowing to their demands. Like, oh, you miss plot point A and plot point A doesn't escalate into plot point B. If it's to the detriment of the gameplay and there's an attitude around it and an arrogance around it, then yeah, I get it because they have way too much sway in what gets changed in the game. All right, now we can talk about Sprouts, the new players. Mm, okay. And while new players might feel a little bit self-conscious about themselves, I think in Very general, true. the community always has a nice place in their heart for new players. Very true. Long before Very true. I was a jaded, cold-blooded animal in this game. Jaded, cold-blooded animal? I was once bewildered and inspired by everything for the first time. Sprouts provide a gateway into that nostalgia that I don't think anyone else can really convey. Nostalgia can I be think annoying. We all chuckle a little bit when we see them die to the same shit that caught us off guard for the first time. Running away from every Dude, I laugh at myself every time I get caught by the thing that caught me off guard for the first time. Multiple times. Everyone with a stack marker or forgetting to turn on tank stance for just a little bit too long. Though you never really have to fear Sprouts, they're usually willing to listen for simple advice and are the people who are willing to try to improve. But a wise man once said, beware the Sprout who does not listen. Don't take everything that you hear from people as ironclad. Right, again, facts, the same thing with the attitude. It comes to down to the attitude. To stack with the party. Everyone usually likes Sprouts. So my recommendation, <laughs> use that power and milk some free karma on Reddit while you still can. Oh, or shit, he's doing that. Or just be a Sprout for upvotes. What the hell do I care? normies we're finally normies. at the bulk of the community the true middle class if you the play bourgeois. Final Fantasy 14 you're probably a normie this is the group that plays uh fairly often they're not going to be subbed 100 percent of the time but more so than the plot watchers they will run weekly content and are usually just trying this is me basically moving up and do a good enough job even if the content that they run is not exactly that hard they are happy to help no my stuff players, is pretty hard but usually just say nothing in chat minus a greeting at the beginning and a thank you at the end if they manage to really screw something up, they will make notes and adjust any time they have to run that content later. They are the ones who are willing to stand on the platforms in Labyrinth of the Ancients and always go into the belly as a DPS on any alliance. Usually pretty relaxed to talk to, fine with being mediocre, but do have a tendency to shit on World of Warcraft, which is a pretty weird fixation. I never even played WoW, but man, this group makes me feel obligated to hate on it. I have experienced a couple of them throughout the raids, although I would say that if this is how he's measuring the normies or the middle class, I would say that just on his terms, I am perhaps a couple steps above that because I actually do care about going beyond mediocre gameplay, honing the combat, and that's just me. Either way, 
Normies do make up the bulk of the community. And but I have no inclination to hate on World of Warcraft, especially for a game I haven't yet played. And even had I played it, I don't think comparing it to 14 in that way, or at least in the gameplay way that he's, he seems to be stratifying all of this in, uh, is a valid point. And Yoshida has made that clear. So, yeah, hating World of Warcraft or comparing it, even comparing World of Warcraft to this to Final Fantasy XIV or how it's taking over World of Warcraft, I think, as Yoshida says, it's the wrong conversation to be having, which is great. I admire him for that. And are pretty okay in general. Now we can get to Raiders, the people who run hard content every week. These are the people who are trying to gear up for best in slot, and they might not play it very often, but they don't need to because they are only focused on whatever the current raid tier is. If you have cleared one Savage Raid, you're already probably part of the top 10% of the player base. This group does yeah. have a firm understanding of game mechanics and probably know how to play their... I see. Yeah, he's certainly stratifying like the worth or how high you are on the hierarchy. Your value as being strictly, almost strictly tied to gameplay or how well you understand the gameplay or how well you engage in the gameplay and how amenable you are to increasing your knowledge of the gameplay. That seems like the impression I'm getting from him. Their class. Maybe. While they don't make up the largest part of the player base, they do get to experience some of the most involved content and honestly some of the most interesting. Okay. Thankfully, they do still get something thrown at them every now and again, but we don't get three ultimates per expansion, so oh well. Now we're going to talk about free-to-play players. F2P players are honestly intimidating for sub-payers. While some free-to-play free -to -play? players probably feel like they owe some debt to the... Wait, are there people that play this game for free? Do you get it just by clearing raids in a certain way or getting a certain rank? Clearing a certain number of raids? People who actually pay to play the game. In reality, free-to-play players are under no obligation to sub-payers. They enjoy Heaven's Word and are probably the only people who even know what an optimized level 60 rotation looks like. This group has managed I hope to, to know maximize what the a content that they have access optimized to level 60 rotation looks limit. like. Leveling everything to 60, running the content that most players who started playing since Stormblood probably never even heard of. In fact, most don't even know. I did play the Odin fight. Additional expansions beyond what they have which access to. I'm told many not ways, many people know about. more intimidating because they probably put in more hours than the people who paid just to be able to experience the plot every single patch. Well, I've been playing a lot more, but it's mainly to optimize my key bindings and my HUD right now. The only downside for them is that they have no friends. We have now finished talking about everybody in the middle class of the social hierarchy. Now it's time to start talking about the... Well, they have no friends because they spend all their time playing Final Fantasy XIV, probably. Billionaires and the people who actually control the entire social structure of Final Fantasy XIV. Control? Wait, wait. Control the social structure of Final Fantasy XIV. I can see where this is... This can be potentially troubling, but let's watch. Begin by talking about Yoshi P. He okay. has an entire tier dedicated to him. He is Jesus Christ himself. This man has founded his own religion, died for our sins, solved world hunger, and even found the cure for coronavirus. I wouldn't say died for our sins. I would say he died in a sense for Square Enix's sins. And despite all these amazing accomplishments, he can never be the top of the pecking order. Oh. And this is because he does not want it. He did right. manage to save this game right. from the brink of death, but at the same time, he has limited his power. That's amazing. See, what I admire so much about Yoshida and his relationship with this game is that clearly he can be at the very, very top if he wanted to, but he's the kind of guy that wouldn't want that for very good reasons and reasons that are related to this whole sort of social hierarchy who runs the whole social atmosphere of this game vibe that i'm getting from this video hmm. because if he became any stronger not even god himself would stand a chance who the hell's that yeah. the community worships him you probably respect him i respect him and i don't he worship the one him. who will fix all of the bugs in cyberpunk 2077 no never gonna happen no one's ever gonna fix that all that's left is for him to purge mentorship now, right above Yoshi P are going to be interior decorators. What? Now, have you ever heard of Housing Extreme 
Well, these players run freaking housing ultimate. The amount of dedication and luck required to get a house in the first place is already bad enough. Wait, is that true? It requires like extreme luck just to get a house? I was recruited by a free company and I saw a bunch of houses resting on a hill, situated on a hill, and a lot of them are pretty decked out. But I just assumed that was just part of the landscape that was reserved for or set up by uh, whenever you start a free company. And, you know, they give you some land and a couple of just base houses, and that's what you got. But you're saying that, or he's saying that getting a house requires just an extreme amount of luck to begin with, just to have a house. But these players interact with this awful clunky decorating system and make the most beautiful interior decorations that even Frank Lloyd Wright himself would be proud of. I see. So they are up in this pecking order because they understand a certain specific area of the game mechanics that is very obscure, that requires a lot of learning and time that most others wouldn't put in. Okay. I have no idea how they do it. If you ever go randomly through the housing districts, there's always a chance that you'll find a house that just overwhelms you with emotion. The good kind of emotions, too. They have all their crafters and gatherers leveled up to be able to make exactly what they need. And I wouldn't be surprised if their planning is down to the micron. The only thing I can say almost for certain is if they decorate their digital house as well as this, their real-life house probably looks like shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's true. It's... Actually, like maybe an RP sort of thing, going back to that, is that your imaginary house, the one you crafted in your ideal world, it's so beautiful is because the one that you're living in is like that. I don't know. I don't think that's such a bad house. You can just repair it up a bit, but he's making it sound like, yeah, you, your house looks so wonderful because you live in a crack shack or something. Just like your character looks so beautiful, so thin, so amazingly perfectly toned and physiqued because you yourself are 300 pounds, you have terrible acne and a receding hairline. Maybe, not necessarily Still, true Still, they do manage to make their ways up into the upper echelons of the social hierarchy. We are now almost at the peak with hardcore raiders. And this I is figured. the type of player who's going to strike fear into your soul. They are born from the game code. Their living spaces are located in the basement of Square Enix's headquarters around the globe, just for a better server connection. Somehow, in other in words, they're obsessed with the gameplay and its mechanics. To play better than an AI designed to play the game. A person with their brain hardwired to the computer could probably not play as well as them. They are the outliers on parses. Not that they even well, need they the are parsers. the outliers parsers in gameplay at them. least. They have their GPU and graphic settings completely tailored for optimal DPS. And despite probably not deserving them, they will stick around in your shitty prog. So here's the thing that I'll discuss a bit later, but sort of kind of irking me the wrong way about this, the way that he's stratifying these people. So he's saying that the people who obsess, like downright obsess about the gameplay and its mechanics are somehow this much higher than the people who downright obsess about RPs, glamours, dies, because I spent eight hours, about eight hours plus, just getting my dies and my glamours and cobbling together the right kind of equipment so I have the right base equipment look just right. And I feel like it took just as much effort and energy to do that as it would have to, as I did, training and honing my combat skills and my rotations in battle. So I'm, it's just really curious to me how he sees those who get obsessed and OCD about the gameplay are somehow this much higher than people who get obsessed and OCD about the glamours or the RP stuff. Hmm. Group and legitimately try to help you. These are the people that mentors wish they could be. They know the content. They breathe. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think it just depends on the attitude again. If, if they're hardcore raiders, but they have an attitude about it, then I consider them to be at the lower than the very bottom. It really comes down to what you're, I think, enjoying this game for, whether it's the glamours, the RP, the combat, the story. 
and how you respond to that expertise or that obsession or that level of enjoyment. It really just depends on if you're willing to share that knowledge in like a very earnest way, or if you're just doing it in a very selfish, elitist, narcissistic sort of way of like perfecting yourself and in a sense, kind of snubbing your nose at those who don't quote unquote get it. The content. They take the content out on a date and ejaculate their knowledge onto other players. Oh God. They are almost the top dog if it wasn't almost. for another social group. And that group is going to go to glamorers. And I'm not talking about the shitty glamours that you see. No Dalmel skin top, not the 2B legging shit. I'm talking about the crowd of players that are single-handedly keeping this game alive. These are the type of players that PvP just to glam. They level every class to 80, including crafters and gatherers, just to get their outfit right and have the perfect aesthetic for every occasion. Okay, I see. So... Sorry, then I was a little bit mistaken. However, I think it raises a, another interesting kind of point. So he is saying that those who OCD and obsess over the glamour stuff, they are at the tip and the apex of the social pecking order. However, what I'm still sensing here is that he's saying it's really those who obsess over the mechanics of glamouring and not the glamour itself the act of trying to get your glamours just looking just right, but like you gotta be the kind of glamour who hunts down all the equipment just to have all the different variations first. So I think he's focusing more on the mechanics. You are more obsessed with the mechanics of glamouring as opposed to spending a lot of time with the glamour and the dyes you already have. They will clear Savage and Ultimate, not for best in slot, but just to look fly as fuck. Not only do they probably parse like a monster, they even look better than you while doing it. Yeah, I, I see what he's saying. What he's saying is that these extreme glamours, they've basically... They, well, the, the hidden implication here is that they've done everything. They are extreme raiders. And the reason why they have this extreme glamour social value on the hierarchy is because they've done everything else. And they've essentially gotten to the end game. They have all the mounts. They have all the... Uh, all the armors and all the dyes. So the implication is that as a apex glamourer, you've mastered all the game mechanics as well. It's not that you spend all this time just focusing on this one other section that has perhaps not necessarily anything to do with the gameplay or the rating, but that this is the culmination of everything once you have already mastered everything below it. It's the kind of player that you encounter only once in a lifetime. And when you see them, you can feel the presence change in your room. They know every mechanic in every fight. Yeah, how to yeah. optimize their DPS at every single level and manipulate the RNG to get the glamour drop that they need. Fuck, they probably decorated their house as well. World leaders fear them and our peers worship them. Fashion fantasy players are the true oligarchs of the Final Fantasy XIV community. With that... You now have a complete understanding of the Final Fantasy XIV community. I do. Now get out there. I would say that at least for this 12 video. Hours in Limsa. Okay, so here's the thing about this video. First off, it's very accurately, I would say satirical, at least. The social pecking hierarchy order, though, sounds like... It does sound like a very MMO kind of thing to have because the game is its own world and ecosystem that'll like kind of naturally develop a kind of who's who. You know, the peasants here, the low class, the nobles up here, and the middle class bourgeois here. And so this video seems to capture it accurately, I will say that at least, with wonderful humor. At least, although from the lens of gameplay, mechanics, and involvement. See, our peers or role players, as much as I think they are derided by the MMO community as some kind of like server resource hog AFK bottom feeders, they are 1000% crucial to the survivability of the franchise. And Square Enix, Square Soft back in the day, knew this and they are smart to play into it. Our peers tend to be more casual gamers, as I think this is this video is making it very clear, who are more into the roleplay, the fantasy, the cosplay, more than the actual game itself. So I can certainly understand this attitude, this kind of, well, we're gonna put all the 
people who are like that at the bottom and all of the people, the hardcore gamers, the raiders, the the people who understand all the game mechanics, we're going to put them at the very top because clearly they understand all the mechanics so deeply and they are the gamers who this game was clearly made for. I have to disagree. It acts as if, with the exception of Yoshi P, that these people at the top, the hardcore raiders, the transmoggers, the extreme interior decorators, they're the ones who run the game, so to speak, since they clearly understand the in-depth game mechanics so well, which they obviously do. I don't know how things work necessarily in the MMO world, since I'm not from that world, but that is unironically not true in the Final Fantasy world. If anything, it's the RPers, the casuals, who really run the game. And I'm not even saying this jokingly. This video works off the assumption that Final Fantasy XIV's social hierarchies are ranked by those who understand the game mechanics best and who is able to master those mechanics best and who are aiming to master those mechanics best. And it puts them at the top because they are the experts. When the truth is, it's the casual gamers that actually carry a game and its series. As heretical, I'm sure, as that may sound to the hardcore gamers, it's always been, and it still is, perfectly fine to play a Final Fantasy game, including 14, for vanity reasons alone, for side quest reasons alone, for Golden Saucer, Extra, mini games, Squats, Triple Triad, or for whatever reason, even RPing, to never do a single duty outside of the required ones, even if those at all, and never learn jack shit about the combat or the mechanics and have no inclination at all to ever want to learn anything about that and still call yourself a fan of the game and totally indulge on it on your own terms. It was the casuals who actually popularized Final Fantasy in the West. Most of the friends that I had in middle school who were introduced to Final Fantasy VI or III as it was known here for the first time, they'd never played an RPG game before, probably had no intention to ever master the game mechanics at all, but they got into it because, oh shit, look at these cool espers and magicite and Bahamut's so freaking cool looking and this awesome Ragnarok sword that casts flair and dress up like Celeste for Halloween. And when Final Fantasy VII came out for me in high school, there were absolutely people who played it just for the RPing aspect, the cosplay, the dressing up their hair like Cloud and getting into the game for pure vanity reasons not even remotely related to the gameplay. They're basically, they're basically hardcore fans of the lore and the fandom, the lifestyle, and casual fans of the gameplay, gameplay mechanics. But if it weren't for those casuals, for those casuals, the Final Fantasy gamers who just played it for those very superficial reasons, or any gamers, Final Fantasy VII couldn't have reached the mass level of success in the West that it had, and subsequent games, including 14 and 16, would never have existed. So I think it's somewhat disingenuous and kind of, honestly kind of elitist actually, to suggest that our peers are the bottom or close to the bottom of the pecking order as far as their role significance in the Final Fantasy 14 community, in comparison to the hardcore raiders, the transmoggers, and so on, when the truth is, had it not been for the former group, the latter, unironically, but seemingly ironic, wouldn't even exist. The Mog Station is proof of that. It's not the hardcore raiders buying all the emotes and the costumes and weapons with real money that's keeping Square Enix alive, which is money that's keeping Final Fantasy XIV alive. What's uniquely cool about Final Fantasy games I've discovered is that, or just any Final Fantasy or fantasy game in general of this scope, is that it allows for both spheres to thrive both the RPers and the hardcore gamers and everyone in between. And 14, as I've discovered, is designed to be a customizable experience <clears throat> that lets you express your alt self to its fullest. Whether that's dressing up like a cat boy in a leotard, dancing at Limsa with glow sticks, something more casual in between, or perfecting your rotations in hardcore combat. I can see this game being like a social media video game platform for special interest communities as well, a la Facebook, but at the same time, cater to super hardcore raiders just in it for the challenge. Final Fantasy has always been, or always had, RPing as part of the culture in 
as in like real life cosplaying, hence dressing up like you know, Quistis and going to a Kupocon as a gang of treepies. And 14 is like that, but on steroids. It's digital cosplaying to the extreme. Unlike the single player non-MMO Final Fantasy games, where the gaming experience is relatively set in stone and the RPing is more of like a thing you do that is beyond the scope of the gameplay itself. 14 actually integrates that part of the community within the game itself. The game is what you choose for it to be. It's given RPing a very ripe venue, I would say even if inadvertently, but only to the extent that it elevates the RPing that already existed in Final Fantasy and other games to the extreme via the character creator. So everything in this video, I think, is it's more like reaffirming to me that Final Fantasy XIV, the game, values all of its members, its community, and needs them actually to coexist. Even if you know, certain segments of that community, perhaps at the higher echelon, might prefer that they didn't. I've never been into Final Fantasy for the RPing or the cosplay, but I thank God that they're out there. People that do enjoy it for that reason are out there. Enjoying the game for whatever reason on your own terms, because frankly, without them, I wouldn't have the parts of the Final Fantasy games that I love so much. Personally, I think it's a very toxic attitude to have to hate gamers who are essentially essential to the existence of the game that you love so much, or to look down on them as if they're at the bottom rung because they're not enjoying the game the way that you're enjoying the game or the way that you think the game should be enjoyed. So just saying that, thank God for Yoshida. I think if he weren't so humble in his approach to the game and all of its fans, all of its fans, including the RPers, Final Fantasy XIV would probably evolve or have evolved into the kind of elitist game run by a few hardcore rating communities that actively berate and discourage new players from ever trying the game out at all. And I think that's absolutely the last thing that he would ever want and absolutely the last thing that I would ever want. I actively encourage everyone, all Final Fantasy gamers, hardcore, casual, in between, different genres, whether MMOs are your thing or not, to definitely try out the game and make it your own experience, whether that's for hardcore gameplay challenge reasons or if you just want to express yourself in a different costume. I think everyone should be welcomed, and if anything, that just grows the player base. And in the end, that means that Square Enix and therefore Final Fantasy and therefore Final Fantasy XIV and ultimately XVI will be allowed to exist. The games will always have this spectrum of things that you can enjoy on your own terms. And I think Final Fantasy going in that direction can only be that much better for it.